Uh, we started uh, with, a, let's say, an initial uh, work trying to find uh, and characterize Israel, Israel's uh, native uh, grape, uh, grapevine uh, population, which was very, very small to start with, and I will explain in a few minutes why. This is uh, actually the first part of what I'm going to speak, and the second part will be more about the uh, archaeological DNA or our uh, goals in this area. Uh, there are a lot of collaborators, some of them are from uh, Italy, um, giving me all of the, let's say, the help with the genetic part and the archaeological parts. So the, the question we asked is, where, is the, where did the Israeli uh, wine varieties disappear? Where, where did they go? We actually, when we come here, uh, uh, after many years of the diaspora, we found only table grapes, and I will explain in a few minutes why. It's known that the, the wine and the grapes and the raisins and all of these uh, uh, very important commodities were, were embedded strongly in the culture, uh, both of the Jews and the nations around here. Uh, they were a very important part of the diet. Uh, and t uh, the wine was very, very much uh, abundant. You could see uh, wine presses all over uh, Israel and it all stopped or start stopping in the 7th century, what happened was that uh, new regimes uh, with Muslim uh, uh, religious came in and they uh, actually uh, oppressed uh, the wine uh, industry because of religious reasons. Th they are not allowed to, to drink wine. So it was like, in the first it was moderate oppression, it was not total oppression. Uh, but uh, during the, s the 13th century came in uh, very uh, zealot uh, Mamluk uh, guys uh, and they actually made <coughs> a decision against wine uh, very strongly and they started uh, actually destroying the wine industry, destroying the vines, destroying the vineyards, breaking down the wine presses. So from this time on, there was a negative selection, a very strong negative se selection against the, the grapevine varieties that were used for wine. Just for a, a short uh, um, explanation, a table grape, that we are used to eat is usually a, a big have a, a bigger berry it has a soft skin you don't want to actually chew it too much uh, it should be fleshy it should have a uh, moderate amounts of uh, sugar and acid not too high uh, on the on the other hand if you want to produce wine you need to have high sugar levels you have to have high acid levels you want to have a lot of polyphenols in the skin so there are a lot of different uh, uh, genetic characteristics for uh, table grapes and a uh, wine grapes and what we found here today in modern times when we come back to israel after so many years in the diaspora we found and, w and people wanted to try and produce wines again and they were looking around and they saw only table grapes no wine grapes and we just explained why these are the guys in charge for all this mess the mamluks this is a mamluk uh, knight so um we start starting with the Baron Rothschild, the uh, uh, renewing uh, industry in Israel. Uh, uh, he uh, goes into Rishon LeZion and makes the, the first winery that you can see up here. Okay, uh, people working in the renewed wine industry. Uh, he, he brings specialists for France. They look around, as I said, and they see unfavorable uh, varieties. So they start bringing from Europe the, their own varieties, the Carignan, Cabernet Sauvignon, and so on. The result is, up to this day, there is no wine production in Israel from indigenous varieties. All of the uh, varieties that are used for wine production in Israel today are uh, from Europe mostly, some of them uh, from uh, uh, America, but most from Europe, mostly from Europe. More than 60,000 tons, mostly Cabernet Sauvignon, Carignan and Merlot, that were brought by the Baron Rothschild uh, officials. Okay, so up to this day, it's a very, very narrowed a uh, population so the question is can we re-establish our ancient wine uh, varieties and our ancient wine practice actually because the style of wine depends on the variety so what we're trying to do now and i will explain is locating and characterizing our local uh, grapevine population here today in israel we are recollecting the hypothesis was that some of these varieties at least survived in the wilds because uh, the grapevine is a very versatile very strong uh, um, uh, uh, species and it can survive in a lot of uh, different uh, conditions 
understanding the connections between the wild and domesticated populations in Israel, we found a large, very large, uh, Vitis vinifera sylvestris population in Israel. Uh, it's huge, and we are uh, characterizing it uh, genetically and by uh, morphology. Uh, to identify, this was actually my main goal, okay, as an enologist, to identify varieties that are suitable for quality wine production today, varieties that are ancient and we can actually introduce back into the industry. And trying to close it all, which is why I'm here, through uh, archaeological findings, trying to understand which of these varieties that we actually recollected from the wilds may have been used for ancient wine production. So the collection map, which uh, consists of more than uh, 330 different uh, accessions uh, today, uh, comes from the northern border of Israel, from the Dan, down to the thousand Negev. So we, we found actually living uh, varieties of Vitis vinifera down in the total dry Negev, and they are unique uh, species, which is very, very important because and on the next stage, we will want to uh, look into them and see if we can find a resistance to drought and salinity in these uh, specific uh, accessions. But uh, you can see that the Silvestris uh, lines uh, cluster in the north of Israel up to the uh, Kinneret. The Sativa is more spread down uh, all over uh, Israel, even in the mountains and on the, on the seashore. A lot of people know uh, around Palmachim and Nitzanin, there are a lot of uh, grapes where, su where some, of them, some of them are uh, unique varieties, uh, uh, specifically indigenous to Israel. Uh, if we look into uh, the Silvestris uh, population, uh, there is a, uh, as I said, uh, there is a very big clustering of it around uh, the north. Now we know that all of this is full too. We are, we are finishing the, the survey now. But what we found is a very interesting uh, thing, that uh, there is a stop of uh, a spread of the uh, Silvestris uh, lines around Nachal Semech in the Kinneret. And we are now hypothesizing that the reason for that is salinity in the ground. So we think that the Silvestris lines are not very stable to uh, salinity. They are not resistant to salinity. And we are going now to uh, check it uh, by uh, uh, taking uh, samples from the uh, ground and uh, water around there and trying to understand. So we found Silvestris only up to here and not at all on the uh, western side of Israel, only on the eastern side and on the up to the Kinneret. Uh, it's divided uh, this way. The, the difference between the Sativa and the Silvestris uh, are uh, in the flower. Uh, the, uh, the Sativa are hermaphrodite. They have male and female uh, organs in the same flower, as you can see here. And the uh, um, Silvestris lines are female or male uh, individuals. So we uh, now have uh, many more than what, you have, uh, well, what I have presented here. Uh, and we are now uh, genetically analyzing them as well. As I said, we want to understand if we can produce wine from these varieties. So some of them make very good wines. You can see samples of wines uh, done from these uh, varieties here. And uh, what uh, was very interesting that we found, you see, this is Bituni is one of the local uh, table grapes known, uh, that were uh, remained here and it has a, a formal name. Some of them are very, very uh, ancient, uh, traditional, historic uh, varieties. Some of them are, are dated uh, 2000 years ago with historic uh, uh, evidence for their names going down in history, like the Bituni. Uh, some of them from our collection. So you see the Bituni is not very suitable for wine production. It has about 18% sugar content, very high pH, which is not very good for wine production, and, and very low TA, total acidity levels. On the other hand, you can see here a collected uh, sample uh, of black grapes, unknown, with no name for now, we have to give a lot of names now, uh, with a lot of sugar, a very good uh, pH level. So there are very good candidates for a, a modern wine production uh, in, these, uh, in this uh, population. A very interesting uh, thing we found that the Silvestris, which are not considered suitable for wine production, uh, in Israel, there are many, many uh, Silvestris varieties that are suitable for wine production. And that's a very important fact because it may 
uh, set us into a direction of domestication in Israel because there is a reason for domestication, okay? Because you can see that the amount of sugar and pH are very, very good for wine production from the Sylvesteries. And we produced wines from the Sylvesteries and they were tasted by uh, specialists in Israel. And they say, look, this is a very good variety. I would like to have it in my uh, vineyard. This may mean for us that Israel was indeed a suitable uh, domestication point. Uh, this is the uh, population analysis done by a 22 SSR uh, analysis. Uh, you can see that most of the uh, sativa population is clustered together. There are some uh, uh, sylvestre uh, lines go, uh, let, let's say, uh, close to these uh, uh, clusterings, but uh, the sylvestres are divided more or less into three uh, groups. Uh, or two or three groups, we're, we're still not uh, sure, they are geographically uh, uh, connected. So, uh, Sylvesteris from, from the very uh, high north are one population, Sylvesteris of the Golan is one population, more or less, and the Sylvesteris of the Kineret region is more or less one population. Uh, it, uh, you can see here the structure analysis, uh, the, most, uh, the best uh, grade of score uh, we got for a, a division of three, uh, three groups, and there is a good score for a five division group. Uh, I, I do believe that this is the right one because of the different Sylvestris populations that we found. And this explains the five uh, group uh, uh, structure analysis uh, result is better to, uh, we can explain better the populations of the Sylvestris by this division. Uh, when uh, putting this uh, on a higher scale of uh, around this all, all of this region, uh, we saw that uh, we are, uh, we say in Hebrew, Am Levada Dishkon, we are separated. So our, uh, our uh, Sylvestris uh, uh, population is totally uh, separated from the rest, uh, from the Sylvestris uh, of uh, Europe uh, and uh, from many, many other European uh, uh, varieties and uh, populations. Uh, indeed, uh, even uh, from uh, the Near East, Near uh, Asian uh, uh, regions. And uh, in general, some of our uh, sativa are similar to or close to uh, uh, European uh, groups, but, m but some of them are totally separated. So now we, we, we're trying to understand on the next uh, step, and I hope Gila will uh, help us with that, to understand, is there an in-house domestication in Israel? Uh, does some of our, maybe some of our sativas came or der were derived out of uh, Sylvester's lines? We even found in Israel something that is very unique. We didn't publish it yet. It's a, it's a white Sylvesteris. It's a, it's a common, um, let's say, uh, knowledge, or it was accepted that uh, the, the, the mutations for white uh, grapes happened much later in domestication. But we found a white Sylvesteris. So the question is, if it's true, or maybe uh, indeed people domesticated white and red grapes and then they spread out? It's a good question. Uh, later on, uh, and this is already uh, in, in our uh, goal to go further into uh, full genome sequencing of archaeological uh, DNA, we, we took 10 of our uh, accessions and we full uh, genome sequenced them on uh, 20x. And we uh, tried to, to find uh, SNPs that uh, explain the most variability in these uh, 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 lines. And we, after that, we clustered them and we saw that they cluster very nicely. Uh, these are uh, Sylvester's lines uh, cluster uh, together very differently from the uh, sativa lines. And the sativa lines, the collected lines, the, the ones that we found around Israel that were not known, not traditional, cluster together. And the uh, traditional uh, sativa lines cluster uh, together with the white ones here and the, the black ones here. The black one, there's just one there. So this was uh, uh, like a, a feeling that we are in the right direction. Uh, and this, uh, these 40 high polymorphic SNPs will uh, be used later by us to uh, analyze the uh, archaeological uh, findings. Now, this is more, for now, more questions than answers. We are very much in the start of this uh, work. Uh, and we uh, want to try to uh, collect uh, samples of archaeological sites of uh, uh, grape seeds and uh, full genome sequence them as possible and try to find out if maybe some of these uh, remains uh, 
are similar to a one or two or three or grouped into our groups of uh, uh, nowadays population. So the stages now are collection of archaeological grape remains, of course, uh, morphological uh, characterization because most of our remains are charred, are burned. Okay, so the, the uh, success rate of uh, DNA sequencing of these remains shouldn't be very high. So we are going with two approaches, one on the morphological uh, uh, way and the other on the genetic way. And I'll explain it. The uh, morphological characterization is done uh, by uh, measurements, as I will show in a few minutes, and by 3D analysis uh, done by Avshalom Karasik here in, uh, in the Hebrew University. Uh, and of course, ADNA extraction and sequencing, which is, we are starting it just now. So uh, you must... Uh, be patient yet. <coughs> uh, so uh, we got a lot of uh, archaeological remains. There are a lot of great grape seeds uh, gr uh, going around in the archaeological sites if someone is actually looking and separating them. Uh, but I think that our, our, mo our uh, most interesting uh, uh, finding, it's not mine of course, it's Dr. Ilat Mazar's uh, finding, is whole grapes coming from the Ophel. This is the Ophel site. From uh, jars like this one, uh, and on this jar, they found an inscription in very, very ancient Hebrew, written Yain Chalak. Yain Chalak is a smooth wine, which gives us a very good context, okay? These grapes are probably, in a way, connected to wine. So, uh, we extracted, uh, of course, uh, seeds from these, uh, which are very good preserved. They are, uh, of course, burned, but they are very, very much whole. They are very nice. So uh, we are analyzing all of these, uh, uh, Ehud uh, Weiss and uh, Itamar Gisle from the uh, Barilan University uh, do the job of uh, collecting the archaeological samples. Um, and of Shalom Karasik, uh, what we're doing with him now is we are very high resolution 3D uh, uh, profiling of, uh, of the different varieties we have now today in Israel. After that, we will want to throw an unknown uh, archaeological uh, finding and trying to see if we can actually match them. There are a lot of epitopes on top of, of each uh, seed. Uh, and if you look in the right resolution, you should have a good uh, uh, identification. So this is one, one part of the job we're doing. In order to do that, we have to know how, how the, the seed shrinks. Because when it's burned, it, it doesn't stay in the same shape. As you can see here, these are uh, uh, seeds burned in different uh, temperatures from 150 degrees to 450 degrees, done by uh, Oshrit here in the audience. And you can see that there is a very specific uh, re region in between uh, 3 hours and 250 degrees and up to uh, 3 hours and 350 degrees that you most of our findings, archaeological findings, look, look in this shape. The rest are very, very... Uh, um, let's say unstable, uh, breaking down very fast, or they are not totally charged. So there is a, a region, and uh, Oshrit also uh, gave it uh, dimensions because we, we want to know how it shrinks. Is, is the shrink is, uh, uh, ident identical in every dimension or not? And we found out that the thickness doesn't change much. What changes a lot is the breadth and the length of the, of the seed. So this can actually, the thickness can give us a good reference to the initial size of the seed. Now, flow work for the DNA extraction, what we're actually doing, we extract DNA, we repair the DNA. The DNA is from burned, from a uh, charred uh, uh, seeds. Um, we, we do an, an end repair, TA end repair, adapter ligation. Then, of course, uh, PCR amplification, we put indexes in and we throw it into Illumina HiSec. This happens today. It was it's just flying to Etzfa today, uh, our first uh, analysis, so I don't have any uh, results to show you yet. But we are very much uh, hopeful about, uh, about this uh, possibility. Uh, we have uh, interesting uh, findings of desiccated seeds. This is the only desiccated seed remain from Timna. This is in uh, Udivice's uh, laboratory. Uh, this might give us much better uh, DNA quality so that can uh, give us a uh, good result later. Uh, so we do have DNA, and it's actually in uh, about 40, 50 si uh, base pair size. Uh, and we actually even have a PCR uh, 
a result. So we do have something there. Now we have to send it and, and sequence it and we'll see what we get. So in summary, we collected and genetically analyzed the initial Israeli uh, uh, grapevine uh, germplasm. We identified varieties suitable for wine production and a lot of Silvestris uh, too. Uh, we collected samples all over Israel of archaeological uh, findings and uh, hopefully we will, uh, let's say, we hope, we are looking forward towards a uh, possible uh, identification. Then we might be able to, to tell people what was the wine that King David actually drank.